I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I hope you are well. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a series of discussions on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Today, I'm pleased to welcome two, although one is as yet yet to appear, uh, hopefully very soon, former National Security Advisors, Tom Donilon and Stephen Hadley. I can't hear anything. Uh, and there he is. Stephen, welcome. Can you hear? Steve, Steve can you hear? Me? I hear you just fine, and I apologize. For you. Terrific. I, I was just can saying I, I, I was pleased to welcome and pleased to welcome now Two former National Security Advisors, Tom Donnell and Steve Hadley, both friends and colleagues. Um, they both deserve long introductions, but in the interest of time, we'll shorten them. Uh, Thomas E. Donnell is chairman of the Black Rock Investment Institute. He served as National Security Advisor to President Barack Obama. Stephen J. Hadley is a principal of Rice Hadley Gates and Manuel LLC, an international strategic consulting firm. He served as National Security Advisor President George W. Bush from 2005 to 2009. He's also the principal editor, I believe that's correct, Steve, of the recently published Hands Off, Handoff, Foreign Policy of George W. Bush, the foreign policy that George W. Bush passed to Barack Obama. I'm doubly pleased, I must say, that we could have a conversation today between two and with two former senior officials representing two different administrations. Uh, both who admire and, res and respect one another. I've long believed that the dividing line for a smart U.S. foreign policy is not between left and right, not between conservative and liberal, not between Democrat and Republican. It's between dumb and smart. And what matters is to try to ensure that America stays on the smart side. And that means tethering policies to the national interests that goes beyond narrower political concerns. It's easier said than done in this challenging world and in a more, even more challenging domestic political environment that we face, but we must try because we face challenges in this world that reflect on our prosperity and our security. We've got a great deal to cover and 40 plus minutes to do it, so let's get going. I wanna start with Russia and Ukraine. Heading into year two, the frame to me looks like a long slog. Uh, no side seems willing to or able to impose its will on the other. Sanctions have yet to undermine Putin's capacity or desire to make war. Um, peacemaking, I think, right now is a thought experiment, uh, other than performative, performative interest in negotiations. So let me ask you both a big question using the Goldilocks trope. After a year of watching the U.S. and the Biden administration, <laughs> in Ukraine, is, is it too much, is it too little, or is it just right? Steve, uh, can I start with you? I would give the administration pretty good marks on what they've done. Um, they, I think, were, uh, the president has been very clear that he stands with and supports Ukraine. They've been very effective in <clears throat> rallying of friends and allies, particularly in Europe, but not just in Europe, <clears throat> to Ukraine's cause. They have, uh, he's been clear that he does not want the United States to be fighting Russia on the ground in Ukraine, uh, but he's been willing to provide military assistance <clears throat> and economic assistance to Ukraine to support them in this fight. If I have any criticism it is that I think we have been slower than we should have been in getting military equipment to the Ukrainians. We have this, we've fallen into this pattern of Ukrainians ask for something, we say no. They ask again, we say no. They ask a third time and we say yes. And then we start putting together the equipment and training the Ukrainians to use it. And I wish we had had it. And, and the president's answered is tried to answer this criticism and said, I think right, very rightly, we've got to do this in a way that keeps our coalition together. And I get that. 
I would hope we would have and would have had and would have going forward something where we say, okay, the Ukrainians want this. If it seems justified by the military situation, let's begin our consultation with our allies. But while we do that, let's assemble the equipment and start training the Ukrainians on it. So once we get a yes decision, there's a short time frame before that equipment can be in the hands of trained Ukrainians able to use it against the Russians. That right. would be my only criticism. And that's why I said, I think we're six months behind. I think we should have adopted that course of action earlier. And I suspect my good friend and colleague, Tom Donlin, wouldn't much disagree with that. I think that right. is a problem. And I think the administration is has recognized it. And I think we're going to see some changes going forward. Right. I know you, you made this comment. I think you said we were six months behind. Uh, you were quoted in the post. <clears throat> Escalation is also obviously a clear factor, fear of escalation, a clear factor in the administration calculation. But Tom, we'll come back to this issue. Let me go to you. Too much, too little, or just right? No, I, I agree. The United States, first of all, Steve, it's great to see you. Great to see you, Aaron. Um, a couple of colleagues of long standing. I was on the uh, receiving end of the 40 memos that the Bush administration prepared at the end of the uh, Bush 43 great administration comment. as I was coming great in comment. and heading up the National Security uh, Council uh, <laughs> transition. And it really was, by the way, I just go on your point, Aaron, before I get into the substance here, that was a model transition. Uh, you know, President Bush uh, instructed, uh, my understanding, it was my mm -hmm. observation, instructed his senior team to, to, to do all it could to uh, ensure that the incoming administration was as well prepared as he possibly could. And I think that's what happened. And um, Steve, I'm about the, the book and the collection of the commentary is about 700 pages. So I would, I would like to tell you, I've been through it all uh, uh, about halfway <laughs> through. I want to try to keep a, try to keep this honest uh, for now. But, uh, but the, uh, it really was, I mean, it's an example of, I think, a model, a model transition. Uh, we didn't have that in 2020, frankly. Yeah. Um, uh, and we did have it in 2000. 2009 on Ukraine, Aaron. So uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity for me to thank Steve for all that. But on the um, on the Ukraine situation, we've done a lot. Um, I think, as Steve said, you know, the, the, and there's been a complicated, been a complicated effort. But the United States has organized a good part of the world, um, Europe, and partners around the, around the world, as as Steve said, to provide uh, support for the Ukrainians. And the and you know the numbers are quite substantial. Uh, you know. The United States has been by far the biggest uh, contributor, both in terms of economic assistance, but also importantly, military assistance. Uh, I think our total assistance right now is probably exceeds $80 billion mm -hmm. uh, to, the, uh, to the Ukrainians. Um, and these are difficult things. And we're doing a lot of the stuff that Steve uh, mentioned now. I think we are training uh, Ukrainian troops in advance on these uh, systems uh, outside the, the, uh, the area of uh, the conflict area. Uh, they're starting to kind of get to the end. We've, we've seen now, I think, the completion of some trainings, for example, on the Patriot system in the United States, and those troops will begin to go back to uh, uh, to Ukraine. So I think there's some there's been some acceleration. There is this process of identifying the right thing, finding it, supplying it, training the troops, and then getting it in the theater. Uh, and I think there has been an acceleration of that. It's critical that it become accelerated right now, though, uh, because we are at the we're at the critical moment in the conflict uh, yeah. over the next uh, six or eight months, I think. You know, at this point, Aaron, as you pointed out, uh, you know, it's been essentially, you know, it has had a couple of phases to it. The initial phase was very important, obviously, and it was a, it, the initial and principal aim of the United States was to ensure that Vladimir Putin's effort uh, to take over the government, decapitate it, right, and install a regime more well, to the liking of Moscow failed. Um, and the United States and, and our supporters around the world had a lot to do with that. But obviously, the Ukrainian, you know, the, the intangible there was probably at the end of at the end of the day the most important thing, which was the Ukrainian will to fight. Uh, and we had a was able to push back that uh, that initial Russian offensive. We've now been in a standstill for a number of months here, of course, hundreds of miles of of, of a of line of conflict. Uh, but we're moving into the spring, and there'll be there'll be counteroffensives on both sides. Uh, and essential. Uh, to the Ukrainian side is going to be U.S. and allied support um, uh, monetarily, but but really obviously critically in, in, in the terms of uh, in terms of weaponry going into the going into the spring. Because on the other side, of course, the uh, you know, the Russians will I think undergo another mobilization, and, and they have the ability to bring up another two or three hundred thousand troops. Um, not a high quality, but nonetheless substantial number to try to affect the uh, situation on the battlefield. So it's a critical period. 
that we are uh, we're heading into right now. And I think we'll know a lot more as we get into the uh, as again the summer. I think at this point, Aaron, I think the outlook is for a long, a long 2023. But essential to yeah. that is continued U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. support and allied support for the uh, for the Ukrainians. So now is the time, I think, to really uh, put the put the as they say, you know, put the pedal to the metal here in terms of support uh, for the Ukrainian uh, military effort. You both pointed out that the will to fight is important, but um, so is the will to fund. And and I think that's going to be critical um, for the remainder of this year. I want to get to the issue uh, of the administration's objective. Yeah, Aaron, on that, by the way, just on, I think yeah. that's important to note at the end of last year, of course, in the omnibus uh, budget uh, steps that were taken by the Congress, there is $45 billion in that. And I think that the administration will depend on the rate of spend. I think the administration believes I can get us you know, d- pretty deeply into this fiscal year. But you're right; uh, that'll be a you know that'll be an important test as we get into the, the late summer and the fall, as to be able to continue to provide the necessary assistance. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. And, and you, you alluded indirectly to the reality of our own domestic political situation as we move into the uh, an, uh, an 18-month uh, campaign in, in the presidential sweepstakes. I want to get to the issue of, of the administration's objectives as you see it, or forget the administration's objectives, as, e, as both of you see it. Can you identify or define what you think is the core objective that we are seeking or we should seek in this conflict? What are we aiming essentially to do? Steve, can I go to you first? Sure. Uh, and I'm speaking for myself. I don't purport to speak for the administration. Uh, I would say, one, the survival of a sovereign Ukraine that is able to pursue its own vision for a democratic, prosperous, and secure future in line and linked to Western institutions. That's what the Ukrainians want. That seems to be what they're fighting for. And that's an objective that is very much in our interests. Secondly, and related, it is to defeat Putin's strategic objective in Ukraine, which is to eliminate Ukraine as a sovereign state and absorb it into Russia. It's very important that that objective be defeated uh, and that Putin's ability to pursue those kinds of objectives in the future be dramatically reduced. This goes all the way back to the invasion of Georgia in 2008 by, by, by the Russians. And when that occurred, we said at the time, if we cannot make Putin pay a strategic price for going into Georgia, tomorrow it'll be Ukraine, and the day after that, it'll be the Baltic states. And if Putin tries to reproduce in, in the Baltic states what he's doing in Ukraine, they are NATO allies. They are subject to an Article 5 protection protection, which would result in a war between NATO and Russia. That's not good for anybody. So it is very important that Putin be set back in his strategic objectives for Ukraine and basically for him to conclude that this is a course of action that should not be repeated uh, either by a reinvasion of Ukraine yet a third time or trying to move into Poland or to the Baltic states. Right. So it's a, I won't categorize it, excuse me, I think you used the word strategic, or maybe the administration has. Um, I interviewed uh, Tori Newland uh, uh, a month or so ago, and she talked about an objective to ensure that, I think the word she used, to make sure that Putin is limping away uh, from the conflict, a strategic defeat, which would involve weakening of Russia, and the end of Russia's illegal occupation of all the Donbass, including Crimea. Is that essentially, before I go to Tom, is that essentially what a strategic defeat on the battlefield means in your view? You know, Aaron, I think it's it's something, a, a practice pointer for the administration. I know it's something that George W. Bush preached. The fact that we should be having this conversation with some uncertainty about what American objectives are or Ukrainian objectives are shows a problem that the president, as steadfast as he has been about our commitment to Ukraine, I think we need to hear 
him answer the questions you're asking Tom and me. To be clear about that, my own view is uh, we we should be careful about articulating objectives that are more extreme than we realistically can achieve. And secondly, I wouldn't want to get too far ahead of the Ukrainians. I wouldn't get too far ahead of events. So I think for the moment, I like the insurance of survival of a secure, democratic and prosperous Ukraine linked to the West, the defeat of Putin's strategic objectives in Ukraine, so he is not tempted to either restart the war later or to, to extend it to some other locations. I think that's the right framing at this point in time, given the, where we are in terms of events on the ground. Right. So clarity on one hand, I, I'd like to hear from the administration, but your answer suggests a degree of ambiguity as well. To Tom, Tom, to you. Life no, is I, I very think ambiguous. I think it's ambiguous. I think, Aaron, we talk, I think the, the, the goal of the United States, right, and the and the supporters of Ukraine is to, is to defeat Russian aggression, to, to uh, and to, you know, to defeat Putin's efforts, right, to um, uh, you know and, uh, invade, take territory from, undermine the government of Ukraine, and providing the means for the Ukrainians to defend themselves and to and to cause that defeat. I think it's. I think that's the. I think that's pretty straight, pretty straightforward. Uh, with, the, with the outcome being right, um, that's straightforward to attain, attain. But you can articulate, I think, a, um, a you know pretty clear vision here. And to attain a Ukraine, as Steve said, is is uh, stable, uh, prosperous, secure, uh, with uh, deepened ties both mil militarily in terms of security and in terms of economics uh, with the West, uh, and to provide most importantly the ability of the Ukrainians to make that choice as a sovereign nation. I think that's the goal of the United States uh, and, the, and, uh, and its allies, and I think that it should be. There are some other things, I think, as we go forward here uh, that'll be important. Uh, to the extent this does get to a negotiation, you want to put the Ukrainians in the best possible position uh, to, uh, to engage in those uh, negotiations from as strong a position as possible. Uh, I also think that um, at some point here, we, we should pursue accountability. Um, uh, for Russian actions. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Putin is now subject to, to at least two arrest warrants from the International Criminal Court. Uh, and there's been kind of right in front of our eyes, a series of war crimes underway in Ukraine by the Russians uh, uh, for, for months now. Um, and I also think we should look at, I think we should take another look here at, um, at our sanctions regime, uh, including the idea of taking the currently frozen assets of, of Russia uh, seizing them and to being determined to put them to use to help to help Ukraine recover uh, from the uh, you know from Ru from the Russian Russian aggression. I know both those things are on the table, kind of current issues. I think they're important in terms of ultimate aims as well. Right. Aaron, let me just make two quick comments. Sure. Tom said, one is these are not just our objectives for Ukraine. These are Ukraine's objectives for Ukraine. It's very important. This isn't the U.S. Because this notion that the Russia is propagating this notion that Ukraine is being a tool of Western objectives to undermine and dismantle Russia. So it's very important that this is this Ukraine survival is Ukraine's objectives for itself and what it is fighting for. And we were supporting them. Secondly, I think it is very important, again, not to fall into the Putin narrative to talk about harming Russia, weakening Russia. Uh, uh, regime change in Russia, the consequence of, of, I think, defeating Putin's strategic objectives will have real consequences for all of those things. But for ours to be articulating those as objectives in an explicit way, I think, plays into Putin's propaganda. He is trying to gear his population for a long struggle against the United States and the West. And I don't think we should give him Propaganda talking points. Yeah. Right. That's an important point, Aaron. By the way, yeah, and, and it's basically it's a. I think it's an important strategic perspective to have globally right now in terms of the, in terms of the competitions that we're that we're in. We have to have, um, I think, here a kind of a long term perspective. Um, you know, we should do everything we can uh, to uh, provide the Ukrainians with uh, the means to have. Take decisive action during the course of 2023 to achieve right. to achieve their goals. But this is a long-term project, 
Right. Uh, it's a long-term project, and um, and we have to have that attitude, uh, I think, and we have to ride the resources over the long haul uh, to ensure that we can continue to support Ukraine, but also support this kind of general, uh, the general up, you know, the most likely outcome here, um, uh, if, to the extent that the war in, in Ukraine can be can be brought to a close of some sort, is going to be a long-term standoff between the West and Russia. Um, and that's something we, I think, have to get, that's a, that's a different mindset. Uh, and Steve um, uh, participated in a Brookings study in 2017, which I was looking at the other day, uh, and it was based on a uh, it was based on a phrase of Dean Atchison's, uh, Harry Truman's Secretary of State, called uh, Situations of Strength, I think was the name of your report, Steve, right? And uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that over the long haul, which is we have to look at building, obviously in Ukraine, but more generally vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis Russia and elsewhere in the world, uh, so-called situations of strength that allows the United States to, uh, to, to, to engage successfully over the long term. Yeah, when you're dealing with the world's ninth or tenth largest economy, the largest country in the world, a country that's got 4,400 plus nuclear warheads, um, that point I think is critically important. Let, let me ask you because you both ap appear to the question. Let's let me put it this way: the administration's view is that you need to tilt the battlefield so that Putin understands, unmistakably understands, that he cannot continue to wage war. And the logic there is to make it unmistakably clear that the longer this war goes on, the more he has to lose. Now that suggests to me a strategy in which we would provide Ukraine with as much military equipment as it needs to take back, and I alluded to this earlier, all of the Donbass, and more specifically to threaten with the weapons that we could uh, give Ukraine to threaten Crimea. The logic being only then will Putin understand that he has more to lose than to gain. Now, that clashes with the notion that escalation has been the great fear all along. We pushed through almost every red line so far, it seems to me, in terms of weapon systems and support for Ukraine. Are, you, are the two of you saying that we need to threaten uh, Putin's hold on, on Crimea or support Ukraine in order to take it back? I'll tell you what I have thought the strategy was. And again, I don't know what I'm not, I don't know what the Ukrainians have in mind. I don't know what the Americans think the, the Ukrainians have well, in that's mind. Not, that's not a uplifting thought though, Steve. But we I, ought to know. I, well, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not in this administration. <laughs> the, the, right. I, I, you wouldn't expect me to know. But of what I have read, and what seems to me likely, is the sense that time may not be on Ukraine's side. Look, they're up against a country that has 10 times the GDP and three times the population and is willing to throw untrained, ill-prepared troops into a meat grinder and get them killed in vast numbers. And this is a, a difficult ally that knows how to wage long-term conflict. So I think there's a sense of which some that says, you know, as long as this takes doesn't really work as a mantra because Ukraine doesn't have that long. That's why Tom is absolutely right. This is such a crucial year. I think the hopes is for a counteroffensive using mobility that surprises the Russia, that punches through the Russian lines and interrupts the land bridge that Russia has constructed over Ukrainian territory from Russia to Crimea and puts Ukrainian troops and weaponry in range of Crimea so they can put Russian forces and supply lines in Crimea at risk and raise the question in Putin's mind, maybe Crimea is at risk. Mm. And I think if Crimea were to be lost to the Ukrainians, that would be a devastating blow for Putin. I think uh, I think that would really be a problematic for him, and I think he knows it. So the hope is that that kind of success this year in 2023 would lead Putin to recalculate and suggest that there are some strategic risks here, and cause him to some one way or another wind down the conflict, either in negotiation or by sadly turning it into yet another frozen conflict. The as as quite frankly, 2014 ended up to be, only this time 
uh, Putin sits on more territory. Yeah. Tom, a final word on Ukraine before we move on to China? No, just as I said, just as I said earlier, this is really kind of a decisive period here. Um, and uh, and I, I would be, if I were making these decisions, willing to take on more risk uh, on the uh, escalation side in order to try to, in order to try to give the Ukrainians as good a position as possible to make territorial territorial uh, gains here during the course of 2023. Uh, and I do think it is, And but the critical thing, Aaron, at the end of the day here, though, is uh, going to be Western resolve. Mm. You know, uh, absent Western resolve, absent the flow of the necessary weapons, the training, the, intel the intelligence and support for Ukraine, uh, they can't make the progress that they need to make, right? Yeah. Uh, no. And they can't achieve the goals that Steve and I have, have set out here. So this is a critical year. It's time to really press hard. Uh, I think that, you know, essentially the way the, the escalation analysis that I've been developing it is that, um, you know, that the Ukrainians should be able to, to, un, to, to, to uh, have access to uh, any sort of weaponry and support that allows them uh, to engage in actions against Russia inside Ukraine and to be as effectively as possible, effective as possible. Uh, and so I, I would be willing to run some escalation risk. I do think, by the way, it's important uh, for, uh, for, for the... Uh, for the administration and the uh, and our allies to have had this obviously in mind, right? All along here, that's a responsible thing to uh, to do when uh, when you've got a, you know, essentially just a very thin line between our efforts and and a nuclear power on the other on the other side. But I think at this point, I would I'm I would be prepared to to press it very hard and run and run and run the risk uh, and the and support of or in furtherance of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine efforts this uh, this spring and fall because I think as, as Steve said, you know the kind of the, the the core kind of basic crass analysis right between the two countries right would favor Russia over the long haul right just in terms of resources and population and and troops and, and things like that right so it's a, this is an important an important period here and I would yeah I guess the I, X factor I guess the X factor which would align with more risk aversion is. Uh, Yes, it's certainly possible that uh, if if Ukrainians can bring the war to Russia and, and threaten Crimea, that that could push Putin uh, to the negotiating table. Um, whether the alternative is plausible or not, I think, is the unknown factor. Yeah. Um, um, I'd love to stay with Ukraine, but... Um, time is not an ally here. I don't want to I don't want to lose this point on asset seizure, though. This is this is an expense. This is an expensive operation, okay? And there are three hundred billion dollars in central bank assets that are frozen yeah. by the United States, the European Union, Japan, and other countries, Canada, uh, in the world. Uh, there's been some, you know, the debate back and forth as to some of the legal niceties of this. Um, Russia has engaged in outright aggression against the Ukraine. There's plenty of precedent for, and Steve knows the precedent from the Kuwait or Iraq uh, situation, right? In the first, first, uh, the first Gulf War. Uh, I do think that's an important point here. To I w and I, I'd like to see it kind of more front and center, because it's three hundred billion dollars that could make a difference in terms of sustainment for Ukraine, and would certainly make a difference in terms of reconstruction. So I'll, that's, I think my, if, that's my pitch. I um, think a few people we know for an additional a, thrust. Right. I think a few people we know had a had a piece the other day in the Washington yeah. Post. Yes, it is. <laughs> today, okay, China. Um, for years, U.S. policies seem to me to have toggled back and forth on one end, trying to engage China to make it part of the system. On the other hand, to contain, to deter China as a rising China as the most serious threat that, that we face. It seems to me both, both uh, approaches have limitations. And I want to ask both of you, since policy really is a description of a process to achieve American interests, if someone asked each of you, identify for us what are U.S. vital interests with respect to China as opposed to what is discretionary, what we must have with respect in our relationship with China as opposed to what would be nice to have. Steve? Well, Aaron, you know, we should... I think your description about toggling back and forth, I would have a different view on the history, but uh, you can decide whether you want to go into that or not. To try to answer your question, I'll be interested in what Tom was, has to say on it. 
I think the first uh, objective really is to protect ourselves. China is now under Xi Jinping, a different China than we confronted under the Bush administration, I think largely uh, different from what uh, Tom confronted in the early years of the Obama administration. Xi Jinping has made a big difference, taken China in a very different direction. And part of that is ongoing uh, theft of our intellectual property, trying to get advantage over us economically in terms of trade and other ways, uh, undermining American image and standing overseas, trying to undermine American dem democracy at home by sowing division. So I think the first thing is we need to protect us ourselves from what is really assault on our interests and our economy and on our values. Second thing is I think we have to deter China from using its increased economic weight and its emerging and increasing military power to intimidate and coerce its neighbors, but also in, in the near abroad, if you will, but also more generally. And this is, requires strengthening our friends and allies, making sure we are present in the region militarily, diplomatically, and economically, uh, make, redoing what the administration is doing is making clear that our uh, nuclear umbrella reaches South Korea and Japan, extended deterrence is vital uh, and still vital. Uh, I think, so I think defend, de deterring and strengthening alliances is a, a key second uh, aspect. Third, I think we have to recognize that in some sense, this competition has become a bit ideological and that China is, is peddling the view that its model of authoritative state capitalism is a model and is an alternative to ours of political democracy and market economics. And that is getting some traction internationally. I think partly it's getting some traction here at home in the United States. I think there are a lot of Americans that are not sure American democracy is all it's cracked up to be. We need a brand refresh at home and we need a brand refresh abroad. But I wouldn't frame all of this as, you know, democracy against authoritarians, but I would recognize that there is an ideological element to it. And we need to be standing up and promoting our own values of democracy, freedom, human rights, rule of law. And in order to do that, we've got problems to fix at home. We've got to reconnect American people to those values. And then we've got to be able to do the most important thing we do to promote those values international, which is to show those values and principles work here at home to provide a secure, prosperous and stable country. Music to my ears. Uh, we live in a glass house to a degree that I never experienced in my lifetime, where our domestic dysfunction is on display, and it it delights our adversaries, and it troubles greatly our our allies. I just wonder the framing that the 21st century is a struggle between authoritarians and democracies. It plays well for democracies, but much of the world it seems to me is not getting the message. Um, I wouldn't frame it. A lot of hedgers, a lot of fence yeah. setters, a lot of folks, I a lot of authoritarians who are our friends. I wouldn't frame it that way. Uh, and I think Tom will probably agree. I say there is an ideological element to our struggle with China. Yes. We've we got to be careful about the framing. So, for right. example, with Ukraine, where we have competing narratives in the global south as to who's responsible for the war in Ukraine and what is at stake. I think we should be putting our weight on those principles that are in the UN Charter that do have broad support internationally, including of China, by the way, mm -hmm. about respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, no use of force to change borders. I think we've got to think about who is the audience we're trying to appeal to. And those principles are very much American principles. They're very essential to the international order we're trying to defend. And I think that is sort of the gravamen of how we can make a case that would appeal to the most countries in the global South. Uh, Tom. I think that's right. You know, we saw kind of the new geop geopolitics and the new map, if you will, of the world that went right now on display the last three days in Moscow. Um, you know, where we, you know, we, we've seen we are in a much more competitive 
uh, phase in history uh, than we had been. Certainly the, the period after the Cold War uh, was a phase where the United States was dominant, where there was productive and constructive relationships among in between uh, uh, important powers. Um, that um, essentially the, um, the uh, uh, U.S. attitude towards markets and efficiencies right, was on the rise uh, in the world. Um, and it was a it was it was a it was a very different world. Today, uh, we have a much more fragmented world. Geopolitical and economic blocks are framing up, if you will. Um, the uh, 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 geopolitics um, is driving energy and, and economic markets, uh, not deglobalizing, but definitely a rewiring of what globalization looks like. Um, I think that, um, and we now have Aaron, as you pointed out, I think a in a large number of countries in the world. Uh, in the old, in the Cold War, we would have called them non-aligned, right? I think now we call them lots of phrases for now middle powers, um, uh, the global south. I, I like to view it as some commentators have said as kind of countries seeking multi-alignments to try to pursue their interests. Uh, and there's an important competition underway in the world. Uh, and the United States is in a, is in a very different phase than, than it had been. In terms of goals with respect to Asia and China, uh, I think Steve's exactly right. The, the United States faces a very aggressive China, uh, and we need to protect and enhance U.S. interests, um, first and foremost. Uh, I think second, we need to uphold the, the order that the United States has basically underwritten in Asia since the end of World War II, which has provided tremendous stability, prosperity, and security uh, for that region of the world, but for the United States and the world, and, and world, uh, the world generally. U.S. presence and investment has had a spectacular impact with respect, again, to kind of prosperity, stability, uh, and security in uh, uh, in Asia. You know, third is I do think it's a national interest. Aaron, you asked about vital national interest. I do think it's an important national interest for the United States uh, to continue uh, to protect and enhance its economic and technological leadership in the world. Um, the United States has had tremendous. Um, advantage, right, and tremendous uh, uh, prosperity and security from its leadership since the end of World War II in the technology space especially, but also in economics, economics generally. And on the technology side, critically important for us to continue these efforts and really kind of lean into these efforts to invest in the United States to, to enhance our technological, uh, technological posture. The tech competition with China is the main game mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of respects right now. And we also have to protect our technological edge, right, from unfair, of uh, being taken unfair advantage of. One of the most important speeches, I think, that have been given in the last few months uh, by an administration official was Jake Sullivan's speech last September uh, about how we are going to have a, we were, the United States is taking a different attitude towards technology, was, and up to that point, that the United States would try to have a protected, an edge in terms of a generation or two of technologies. Now, and Jake Sullivan laid out, um, a wholly different attitude, I think, which is appropriate in the current circumstance, which is the United States would seek to get as big a lead in, in these foundational technologies as possible and maintain it as long as long as possible. So this technological and economic competition, uh, I think, is, is, is essential to U.S. interest. And last, I think we need to continue to meet our security and other guarantees with our allies uh, in, the, uh, in the region, which I think the administration is actually done an excellent job at, frankly. I think objectively, I think you look at the efforts um, uh, by the president, by Secretary Blinken, by Kurt Campbell uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the region to build out these structures, if you will. Again, these, these situations of strength, right? I think that as, as, you, as you could look at them, I think it's very important some, and effective. Yeah, I'm some, gonna of see some, of some of your uh, listeners are going to be asking themselves, well, what about cooperation? Aha, uh -huh. you know, and, had you and, not interrupted me, I was going there. So, uh, so go ahead, please. And, and I would say I would have added that as a fourth item, and Tom might have added it, his list. Yes, there are issues, global issues, pandemics, climate change, stability of the global financial system needed to be attended to. They're not going to be attended to successfully if China and the United States won't cooperate. The challenge is, can we cooperate on those areas where it's in our mutual interest, where we're not doing favors for each other and still manage all the competitive pressures that Tom has talked about. Agreed. And that's the problem. And that's going to require each and both countries to decide they're not going to hold cooperation, cooperation on global issues like that hostage to these competitive challenges that we have in our bilateral relationship. 
That's a big lift and not the yeah. kind of things that the Chinese do willingly. Yeah, I think it's a, also there's a process piece to this too. I think Aaron, you know, the, um, I, you know, I outline. You get you you've got a sense of my kind of lean on this, right? At this point, in terms of the, in terms of the competitive aspects of what we're, of what we're facing here, uh, but it's the two the two largest economies, the two most important countries in the world, right? We do have an obligation to kind of work through a set of relationships where we can communicate, right, and try to find areas where we can cooperate. That requires as a process matter, though. I think much more intensive um, uh, uh, communication from both sides, you know, and this yes, is, I don't, indeed. and the, and the Chinese in particular, by the way, have been reluctant, right, to engage in the kinds of communication mechanisms that some of which, Steve, as you know, right, we had during the Cold War, particularly on the military to military side, right, we're not even at that level yet, I don't think, in a lot of areas with respect to China. You know, it's interesting, I was reading um, a piece the other day, a RAND piece, actually, on, on George Schultz. Uh, and it's laid out something which I hadn't realized that during the course of his tenure as Secretary of State, at the height of the Cold War, right, working for a president who called out the evil empire, right, uh, he met with his counterpart over 30 times. Uh, you know, kind of this engagement. Um, and some of the meetings didn't accomplish anything. Some of them accomplished something. Some of them were some of them were would have been unpleasant meetings. But at some points, they also were able to get some cooperative, cooperative steps forward. And I think you have to get to a point where meeting is not a, like an unusual event um, and allow some sort. Now, now, people say, well, that's just process, right? You know, and talk for the sake of talking doesn't get you doesn't get you much. Well, in diplomacy, at the end of the day, I think kind of intensive interactions actually provides at least the opportunity uh, to surface the kinds of cooperative areas that Steve was talking about. Yeah, I worked for Schultz and, and tending the, what he described as tending the garden was extremely important. Even even when the prospects of growing things in the garden, other than weeds, were not, was not terribly uplifting, that there was a, a plausible case. My colleague at Carnegie, uh, Evan Feigenbaum, talks about managed enmity, and that's what both of you appear to be saying um, is about the best we're going to be able to do in the period in which we now find ourselves. Uh, avoidance of war. I mean, again, I'd love to ask you about Taiwan. We're, we're, we're running out of time, and there are at least two other issues I want to cover. But I, I, will, I will ask you this. Um, is, is Taiwan's independence and sovereignty a vital national interest to the United States? And vital national interest means it's fundamental to American security and prosperity, and we would be prepared to defend Taiwan uh, with American power, if necessary. Does it fall into that basket? Because Ukraine, it may or may not be a vital American national interest. We are not prepared to deploy American troops uh, or, frankly, seemingly risk confrontation between Russia and NATO over Ukraine. Are we prepared, and should we be prepared? Forget the administration's view. What do you two think about Taiwan? A vital national American interest, risking war if necessary. We can move on. It's a hard one. Tom, you I get to go first. You get to go first on this one. I'll just say one thing on your managed enmity. I wouldn't use the enmity word. I hope uh -huh. China and the United States are not eminent enemies yet, but right. certainly it is about managed con competition so that that competition doesn't drive us into confrontation and conflict, which from which we would all lose. Fair enough. Yeah, Aaron, on Taiwan, yeah, they, we have had in place since 1979 a structure, right, a set of principles, right, uh, policies, both legislative and executive pursuit policies in the United States, right, which have kept the peace, right, have provided stability, have allowed Taiwan to become a flourishing democracy and economy, right? Um, and I think that that structure that was put in place uh, uh, arising out of the formal recognition of, of diplomatic relations by the United States has proved to be important and durable. And I think that that should be the basis on which we approach the, the Taiwan. Um, and I think that, you know, it's been, the, it's been the Chinese side who seems to have, you know, uh, Become impatient with that uh, with that uh, structure, uh, and I'd encourage them not to be. Right, uh, mm -hmm. that's the first point. 
The second point, I think, is that um, the best way uh, to preserve that structure, which again, I think has actually worked well for all three parties uh, involved, the best way to preserve that structure is for the United States uh, to uh, have the ability to deter uh, an action by China to up, upend the status quo militarily. And that, that is a, that's a major project. By the way, you, you have to read the whole Taiwan Relations Act. There's also, there's another aspect to it, right? In addition to providing Taiwan with the uh, necessary uh, elements it needs to defend itself, the Taiwan Relations Act also calls upon the United States to be able to, to, be able to have the forces in place and the resources to be able to defend that, uh, our, our interests in, uh, uh, in the Western Pacific as well. So I think that the, that the I do think that there's a, there's, a, there's a path forward here with appropriate uh, focus, resources um, to be able to deter, uh, to deter China, but we have to be, we have to be about it in a very serious, in a very serious way. Uh, yeah. So I think the structure that we had in place for whatever number of years that is, I think was a sound structure uh, to the extent that, um, that one of the parties wants to, that China uh, wants to disrupt that uh, and threaten uh, to disrupt that through uh, uh, non-peaceful means or forceful means or military means, the United States should be in a position to provide Taiwan the means to defend itself, but also to, to, to be uh, prepared to, you know, I think in the, in the, in, uh, in the lead up to anything like that, to, to engage in, in effective deterrence. And I think that's what the, I think that's what the policy administration is now. Um, it will, by the way, it will, this is the, we don't have time to talk about this today. It will, uh, requires something we talked about with respect to Ukraine and the and the European security situation, uh, a long term focus. Yeah. This is a this is a multi year, long term effort by the United States that we're going to under, we're going to undertake here. This is not a this is not a project that we're going to work on for a couple of years. It's going to be fine. That's not what's going to happen, and that will require something which has really kind of come to the fore here, I think, in this post post Cold War era, and that's the importance of U.S. hard power. And that's going to require, I think, a real look at our industrial base uh, and whether or not we can actually provide what's necessary in terms of armament, uh, materiel, resources uh, to have credible deterrence, uh, both in Europe and in Asia. Steve, Steve, I don't know what your reaction is to that. I, I think I agree with, I think Tom has it framed right. I would simplify it and say this. I think the whole one point Richard Haas makes We've managed this problem successfully since the opening of China in the 1970s. And that's a real accomplishment of our foreign policy, in some sense, Taiwanese foreign policy and Chinese foreign policy. So we need to try to continue that. Two, the touchstone is to deterring China from using military force against Taiwan and imposing a solution on Taiwan. Because the reality and why the emphasis is on deterrence is that the reality is a war over Taiwan is a disaster first and foremost for the Taiwanese. It will destroy that country. And the consequences for the United States and China and the world economy will be grave. And each of our countries, China and the United States will not as a consequence be able to achieve all that they want to do for their own people at home in terms of security, stability, and prosperity. So the gist of this has got to be avoidance of the use of force, and the way to do that is to deter. And I think the way you deter that is less by the rhetoric, rhetoric of our policy, you know, whether it's strategic ambiguity or declaratory policy. I think in some sense that's an excuse. Uh, changing the words is an excuse for not doing the things Tom talked about that we really need to do in terms of with Taiwan and with our own capabilities in the region and that of our friends and allies to deter use of military force over Taiwan because everybody loses in that case. Yeah, you know, officializing our relationship with Taiwan though has become a, a big issue uh, and it's driven by domestic politics. And I wonder whether or not that isn't part um, not the whole, but part part of the problem. I mean, if Taiwan Relations Act and one China policy, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it means today with respect to that aspect of it. Um, 
we're over time and um, I'd be remiss. It's the 20th anniversary. Steve, you've spoken about this um, of the Iraq war. Uh, lessons learned to me are, are very important. I left government in January of 03. That was two months before um, we invaded Iraq. Um, and, and I'm wondering, um, the two transgressions of the great power to me uh, are, are when there is a sense of omnipotence on one hand and omniscience on the other, that we can do everything and that we know everything. And I'm wondering, not to discount the environment in which uh, the Bush administration, in which I, I worked for two years, was functioning in the wake of 9-11. But I'm just wondering, I'll ask each of you, um, Iraq is free or Saddam is gone. Um, there are two constants in Iraq, instability and insecurity that still prevail. The costs were, were very high in terms of Iraqi lives, American lives. I'm just wondering, looking back now for each of you, um, was the return worth the investment? And if you had to identify just one lesson that we've lear actually learned, what would it be? Tom, can I start with you? Okay. Well, um, you know, I think the United States that pay, I mean, Steve and I, will di we've agreed on a lot, they will probably disagree on this, but the, the United States, uh, and you know, we came into, I came into office working for a president who would oppose the Iraq war. Um, and, um, you know, str strongly during the course of his campaign and before he declared for president. Um, uh, it, it was a tremendously high cost to the United States. And we could list the, we could list the cost both in terms of uh, resources and uh, blood, treasure, reputation of the United States. Um, and that was, it, it, and it was, a, um, I think, a cost that we're still in some ways paying a high, a high price for. Um, it underscores for me um, the importance of um, uh, looking at every al every every alternative, right? Um, um, as you study something this serious, such as going to war, um, uh, short of war, and to make sure that you've done that, you kind of have, have done that. Um, it, it it feels to me like uh, that um, it's also a, an important lesson uh, in um, kind of the, the the difficulty of trying to affect change in a society uh, long distance from your shores, very distant from your history, right? With its own history and dynamics. Um, and I think that's an important, uh, certainly an important lesson, yeah. I think uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the United States. Um, but that's my, you know, my view is we paid a high price. You know, my, my, you know, my judgment um, is that um, it was, a, uh, I think at the end of the day, a mistake uh, for the United States. Um, I don't think, by the way, you know, I don't uh, that I, don't, I know that that I, I was not sitting there, right, uh, in the wake of 9/11 in the White House and Steve and Steve's office, uh, uh, and didn't have those uh, those kinds of pressures. So it's you know it's it's a little easier 20 20 years later to kind of give kind of clinical clinical uh, strategic and and other kinds of analysis. But that's my uh, that's my view, and I do think that this um, that this that the importance of understanding the difficulty of trying to take on um, these kinds of efforts to to change societies uh, and seek outcomes, uh, direct outcomes in societies um, very distant from us in almost every way, um, mm -hmm. is an important lesson for the uh, important lesson for us. Right. By the way, we 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 learned that lesson, I think, again in Afghanistan um, mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the nation's longest military involvement. Steve. Well, this is, uh, you know, we could have another session going yeah. 55 yeah. minutes on this topic. Yeah. Just a few things to think about. Sure. A uh, lot of myths about Iraq. Um, it was not to promote freedom through the barrel of a gun. It was to address what we perceive to be real national security concerns to us and to our allies in the region of a regime that 17 UN Security Council resolutions said Saddam was pursuing weapons of mass destruction, oppressing his people, supporting terror, and uh, and invading his neighbors, and he was supposed to stop. And we were over 12 years unable to enforce that writ. I think in retrospect, if we had known that he did not have the stockpiles of, uh, of uh, weapons of mass destruction, chemical and biological weapons, did not have an active nuclear program at the time, 
I don't think the president could have taken the country to war even if he'd wanted to. We had overwhelming bipartisan support from both houses of Congress. We wouldn't have had that if we had known that, I think. And we would, and whether it would, it would have been a good idea or not, we wouldn't have gone to war there. I think we paid a huge price, huge price, in terms of American and coalition life and tre lives and treasure, but overwhelmingly in terms of Iraqi suffering, economic setback, uh, loss of life for our failure to stabilize Iraq between 2003 and 2007. We did defeat Al Qaeda in Iraq and did bring the level of violence down to the point where it did not. Uh, reflect a strategic threat to the Iraqi regime because of the surge. And by 20, 2011, Barack Obama pulls out all of our troops out of Iraq. And for the United States, this supposedly endless war is over in 2011. But it's interesting, for a lot of reasons, Al-Qaeda retools itself as ISIS establishes a beachhead in Syria, goes in in 2014 and takes over 40% of Iraq. And not George W. Bush, but President Barack Obama puts troops in to Iraq to help the Iraqis throw out Al-Qaeda and reestablish so sovereignty over their country in 2018. Three sort of lessons I would take from this. One is something I've cribbed from John Allen, General John Allen, who is uh, a wonderful uh, officer for the United States military and a great patriot. He said, we do our planning wrong. We start with phase one, getting ready for the invasion, phase two, the invasion, phase three, and then phase four, which is what are we going to do after we win? He said, we need to plan these kinds of interventions from phase four. Where do we want to end up and then work backwards? so that we make sure that what we do to liberate a country doesn't defeat where we want it to end up in the end. I think that's right. Secondly, we've got a different model. Nobody wants to put 160,000 troops into a conflict zone like we did in Iraq. Um, we've got a different model that has been developed over a couple administrations, this by, with, and through, whereby we have a modest number of troops that help local forces train and, and support them in dealing with their own security challenges. We still have 2,500 troops in Iraq today. It's a good thing to perform that mission. The Shia-led government has requested the United States to leave those troops there as a way to help balancing Iranian influence. Um, so we have a different model and we've learned here. Third, I think to Tom's point, the kinds of transformation we had hoped for and that the Iraqis had hoped for to build a free, stable, and prosperous society takes a long time. You know, we went through it in Japan after World War II, Europe after World War II, South Korea after the Korean War, and troops are still there helping provide some stability and security. So we have to recognize that this is, uh, we got to be in this for the long term. And finally, I would say that every administration has to recognize that the things it started aren't gonna get finished on its administration. They're gonna depend on the efforts of future administrations. And we need to keep that in mind as we make these commitments. You know, that, that depends almost entirely of not measuring American foreign policy in what I call four, four or eight increments, yep. what I call administration time. That's essentially, but that's so incredibly more difficult now um, with our dysfunction domestically. How you create a foreign policy for what? For generational challenges? When you have a, when you have a toggle, tick tock back and forth between administrations. And you know, frankly, with tremendous continuity for much of the last 60 plus years in American we, foreign we, policy. We've done it in the past. Remember, we did it in the Cold War. Sometimes it was a near run thing that we could keep our consensus together. We've done it in the war on terror. We have kept the country safe in terms of interventions. We've done a pretty good job in Colombia, for example, an effort starting in the Clinton administration, spanning four administrations of different policies. So we can do this.
Uh, we've done it in terms, for example, where this is also the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR and the effort by started by the Bush administration, continued by every administration thereafter to deal with HIV AIDS on the continent of Africa. But it requires taking the time to build a bipartisan consensus mm -hmm. between the executive branch and the Congress, both houses of Congress, and building a support within the American people. And that's, you know, that's a long process and one that our current political situation mm -hmm. makes it particularly difficult to do, but that's the only way you get a sustained policy over time, administration to administration, regardless of policy. It's hard work, but it's worth it. No, it's interesting to see. I'm more, I'm more worried about this than, than you are, because I do think that the, that the, 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 the pendulum swings have gotten, in the, you know, the, from the last administration, this administration, and even compared to the Obama and Bush administrations, the swing, the swing in, 20, in 2016 and 2020 was particularly was particularly wide away from uh, kind of um, approaches that had been really kind of generally agreed on between the between the, between the two between the two parties, and I and I think we do you know the world right now is worried about that, frankly. I agree I with that, Tom. But remember the thing about pendulums; they swing out, yeah. and after a while, they start swinging back. Yeah. And my hope is the American people are going to start insisting that their politicians. You know, swing this pendulum a little bit. Yeah. Back. But it's a I, risk right now in the world. I want to add one, one last thing I wanted to point out on this. This, this point about different models is really important. Um, and I, I, I you know, was fo quite focused on this in, during my tenure, which is that, in fact, when the ISIS challenge did arise uh, in uh, Iraq, um, uh, that the, uh, we did develop a different model, largely under the leadership of uh, our, our late friend Ash Carter. Um, yep. which is a very different way and a more sustainable way, if you will, I think, of meeting, uh, meeting the kind of counterterrorism and adversarial challenges that we have. We have in a place like that, which, 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 which really that. requires us uh, to, to put responsibility on the, on the, on the, 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 the uh, local government, right, and the local troops along and, and work on a way for us, right, to provide the best possible assistance that we can in the most effective way. And that model has worked uh, has worked in Iraq, frankly. Yes, indeed. But it was a very different, yeah. it was very different from the very different from the model right, right. that was put in place in 2002. Right. Well, we've not only come to the end of our 45 minutes, we're well over it. But I want to thank uh, both of you um, for appearing together. It's very important to me. And um, uh, I think that sort of exchange um, with civility and affection, borrowing ideas from wherever you find them um, is exactly what's required to create the kind of national interest consensus that would allow American foreign policy against great odds out there in a cruel and unforgiving world to chalk up more successes and failures. So I want to thank both of you. I hope at some point in a year or so, I can persuade you both to come back and we'll take another look at the world. Um, on Carnegie Connects. You know, Aaron, before you finish on that, I'm going to give, take one more minute. You know, the, 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 this, I think your point's very important. Um, and listen, Steve and I will disagree on, on things, right? And we have been on the other side of campaigns, right? Presidential campaigns, right? You know, and disagreed pretty vociferously on things. But you really can't have sat in the offices where he and where Steve and I have sat and not appreciate the importance of engaging um, and um, Kind of understanding the critique on the other side, and really, at the end of the day, understanding how important it is to bring, you know, people who care about the country together uh, to work on policies together. So it's a this is a good. I, I commend you on kind of pull, pulling this together. But you really couldn't. I don't think Steve, you could. You couldn't sit where you and I have sat and not understand the importance. Right. The importance of this. Aaron, thank well, you for doing this. We're very grateful. It was great. Take care and be well. Bye bye. Bye bye.